Good afternoon, everyone. After having dug to a depth of 10 feet last year, New York scientists found traces of copper wire that dated back 100 years and determined that their ancestors had sophisticated telephone system 100 years ago. Not to be outdone, California archaeologists dug to a depth of 20 feet, found remnants of 200-year-old copper wire, and determined that their California ancestors had a sophisticated telecommunication system a full 100 years before the New Yorkers. About a week later, a farmer in Martin County, North Carolina, digging on his 2,000-acre farm, Bubba Johnson, <laughs> dug to a depth of 30 feet and found absolutely nothing. Being a self-taught archaeologist, he concluded, our North Carolina ancestors 300 years ago had already gone wireless. And that's just one of the many reasons it's great to do business in North Carolina. Welcome to the annual meeting of the Jacksonville Onslow Economic Development, also known as the Committee of 100. I'm Joey Carter, Chairman of the Joe Ed Board of Directors. I want you to continue to eat. There's plenty more out in the hallway. Uh, we've got a pretty full agenda, so we're going to try to move through this very quickly and be very aware of the sacrifice of time you've all made. And I just want to thank you all for being here today. I do want to acknowledge some special guests that we have with us today. Um, <clears throat> Chairman of the Onslow County Board of Commissioners, Mr. Jack Bright, is with us. Um, Royce Bennett with Onslow County. <clears throat> and if you will, if you hold your applause till the end, we'll give everybody the proper recognition. Uh, Royce Bennett, Onslow County Commissioner. We have Brian Jackson, City Council Member with Jacksonville. Hans Miller, Sheriff of Onslow County, is here with us. Um, Adam Cal Caldwell with Senator Tillis' office. Not sure if Adam has made it yet. Miss Janet Bradbury with Senator Burr's office. William Moore with Congressman Jones' office. And Steve Wangerin, representing Department of Commerce Rural in in Infrastructure Authority. Sorry, I'll get that out. If you would, give all those folks a round of applause. Welcome them for being here. At this time, I'd like to uh, ask, if you would, to stand with me for our invocation, followed directly by the Pledge of Allegiance to our flag. Please pray with me. Father, we just thank you today for the blessing that we have to live in this great United States, in this wonderful state of North Carolina, and in particular, the privilege to live in and do work in our great Onslow County. God, we know we're not always what we need to be and who we need to be, but we thank you that through your strength and power, we're not who we used to be. I just want to thank you now for our meal today. Thank you for this wonderful community. Be with us as we do work on behalf of our community, that all that we say and do is honoring to you. And Father, I pray today if there's anyone here who does not know you personally, that today is the day that that can change. And we just offer this prayer in the name of your Son and our Savior, Jesus. Amen. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. You may be seated. At this time, I'd like to call our 2018 annual business meeting to order, and we do have a quorum. Our only item of business today is the election of our 2018-2019 directors. Um, our organization is led 
by a group of 18 elected board members and 20 ex officio members. All of these folks who give unselfishly of their time make a commitment to help us grow our community, to work and live in this wonderful community. If you'll notice that we have a list of our 2017-2018 directors in your program. Right now, I'd like to thank our departing directors from the board, Mr. Gary Danford with Wells Fargo and Tom Rollins with Gulfstream Steel and Supply. Thank you for your contributions to the Joe Ed board and to economic prosperity in our community. Would you please help me in thanking these gentlemen as they rotate off? <clears throat> our nominating committee has nominated the following individuals. You will see them in your program. And if I had my program, I'd see them. I got the story right at the beginning. I just didn't bring all my paperwork up. The ballot is, uh, is insert in your program. I'd like to uh, recognize these individuals that have agreed to a serve, have agreed to serve three-year terms. And again, their names are in, but I'd like to recognize them. And if you would, as I call your name, if you would please stand and remain standing until I've read the entire slate of nominees. Mr. Matt Ray with Ray Properties. Randy Tomsick with Wells Fargo. Jeff T. Clark with the Jones Onslow EMC. Mike Alford with Marine Chevrolet. Chris Klassen with BB&T. And Matt Raymond III with Sanders Ford. At this time, I would ask, are there any other nominations from the floor? We have a motion. Do we have a second? second? All those in favor say aye. Aye. And the nominations are closed. At this time, we will vote. All of those approved and accepting these members as uh, directors for the Joe Ed Board, please indicate by saying aye. All opposed? Thank you for agreeing to serve. Please help me in thanking these individuals. And with that, our business is done, and I'd like to recognize our executive director, Ms. Sheila Knight, for an update. Thank you. Thank you, Joey. I would actually like to ask the newly elected directors to stand and all of the uh, existing directors in the room from 2017-18 to please stand so that you can get an idea of the folks that help us um, daily with our board activities. Come on, don't be shy. There we go. Thank you all very much. Well, good afternoon. I'm going to give you a brief update because I know we're really here to uh, listen to our two special guests this afternoon. Um, so I will try to make this fast. And I have my timer in the back of the room that's going to kind of help guide me, and I'll try to pay attention. As Ed Garris says, I can't talk if I don't have a PowerPoint, but I'm going to talk fast, Ed, so start the timing. In 2014, Joe Ed embarked on a five-year strategic plan. We are now earing at ending year four, near the end of year four, and I wanted to give you an update as we are this year getting ready to embark on planning our next five years. Um, the five-year plan had four strategies. Uh, those four strategies were designed to help elevate Jacksonville and Onslow and Joe Ed to a position to actively engage in economic development throughout the state of North Carolina um, as the economy recovered. And by, uh, these strategies were designed to basically accomplish two things. One was to help us build relationships, um, or as Dan Oliver used to say, put a face on Jacksonville and Onslow County. And that was the number one task that was given to me. 
building the relationships with our significant regional and state partners. So on this uh, slide, you'll see that we have a relationship certainly with the state of North Carolina, and we're very fortunate today to have a representative from the North Carolina Department of Commerce, Mr. Mark Sutherland, as part of their uh, rural planning um, staff. Uh, another one of our significant partners, of course, is North Carolina East Alliance, with whom we've had a longstanding relationship, and John Chafee, CEO of um, NC East Alliance, is here today. And then our recent um, uh, association with the North Carolina Southeast Partnership, Steve Yost, is with us today. Thank you. So, and of course, you'll hear later from uh, Frank Emery and Chris Chung, both from the Economic Development Partnership of North Carolina, which will, completes the circle. And I think the fact that we have all of our, those significant regional state partners in the room with us today speaks to the fact that we have, in fact, developed the relationships that will help us participate as we go forward. So, and, and to help us be a credible player. I want to show you that the map that these two partnerships that we're involved in brings, um, I think it brings into focus the significant part of state North, of North Carolina. Between these two partnerships we're covering, we're a part of 44 counties. That's certainly well over a third and almost a half of the state of North Carolina. We've got a longstanding relationship with the East Alliance and our um, fairly new relationship with the Southeast Partnership enables us to take advantage of their fairly unique and different ways of pursuing potential prospects for Eastern North Carolina. But it also shows uh, um, and, and supports one of the uh, beliefs that we have is that Eastern North Carolina needs to be considered um, from a regional basis in order for us to adequately um, compete with some of the larger metropolitan areas these days. So I thank you all for your partnership and your collaboration and for allowing us to, to work so well with you. The second part of the strategy was to help us make sure that we had available product. And as many of you will certainly remember, um, coming, being born out of the depths of the worst recession this country's ever had, we actually had our first Onslow County shell building built um, in uh, Burton Park in 2010. Well, about four years later, um, it was sold, which in shell building life means it was barely a toddler. But that was sold, um, and uh, as many of you um, have heard uh, certainly me say over and over again, this was a very significant part of our program. Uh, it was a strategy led by um, our chairman at the time, I think Billy Sewell, who helped put that um, shell building on the ground with the help of Onslow County, because the philosophy that we've certainly understood in my years in real estate certainly supported is that you can't sell from an empty wagon. So you've got to have some product to sell, and you may hear a little more about that later. So that has was sold. Then, through some information that Steve Wangren, our um, appointed member to the Rural Infrastructure Authority, brought back to Onslow County, we were able to take advantage of a matching grant program, a quite um, good matching grant program that allowed us to extend the road into the remaining 250 acres of Burton Park, giving us access to now um, many more sites that were zoned industrial so that we can continue our program. And in that new, on that new road, we were able to, uh, in conjunction with Onslow County, build the new shell building number two. Joe Ed contributed $250,000 to the construction of that building um, in order to partner and have that building available. It is a 30,000 square foot shell building. It is expandable to 60,000. And actually, quite frankly, due to a couple of um, RFIs that I've had lately, I've been able to get an engineer determined that we could actually get up to about 100,000 square feet uh, using the full lots there. So Steve, John, FYI, okay. <laughs> Um, we also need to have, oh, by the way, I wanted to let you know that that shell building, by having it available, has enabled me to respond to about 40% of the RFIs that I've gotten year to date this year. If I did not have that building, I would not have been able to respond to those RFIs because, as Chris will probably tell you later, the availability of an existing building is, is truly almost number one on about 75% of our RFIs. It also has allowed me right now to be engaged in five, five projects. A little more to come about that.
We also have been instrumental in, in identifying and helping to develop additional sites throughout the county. We helped to navigate the Camp Davis Industrial Park, Tom Rollins and his brother Bernie, to um, develop that site. And we have Donna Phillips here today from Duke Energy. That program is, is very helpful in, in helping make sure you make the right decisions when you're designing a park, and then ultimately they stand behind to help get it marketed. I believe that you will hear a little more from me maybe in a few weeks about a, um, a grand opening opportunity there at that park. Okay. We, of course, also have been working with Chris White at the airport. Thank you, Chris, for being here today. As he knows of the demand that we are starting to see for runway access available sites. And of course, we have that beautiful new terminal out there and general aviation terminal and a tower going up. So all we need is our two lane road going straight to the park and we'll be set to go, won't we, Chris? Very good, thank you. And of course, we also are very fortunate to have a business park in Jacksonville that the city of Jacksonville owns. So the one message that I, that I think I've been able to carry very effectively recently is that we do have product, and that's what we need to be in the game. But as many of you have often heard from me say, um, the recruitment may be the sexy part of real estate. It gets the ribbon cuttings and the photo ops, but it's not really the most important in my opinion. The most important really is your business retention and expansion program. And I say this year after year up here. Um, Although Frank and Chris, you by now have realized that we are very, very blessed to have our number one in industry here, or economic engine, I should say, is the United States Marine Corps. And we're very proud to have them. We are proud to be the home of our heroes. But we are actually more diversified than many people realize. Many people, even in Onslow County, probably don't realize some of the diversification we have. But there's about 25 uh, companies that we have a tendency to, I'll say, take care of. Um, and try to stay um, very, very close with. We want them to call us first. So we work very hard to build a very strong relationship. And we're very pleased to say they do call us. They call us if they need workforce assistance. They'll call us if they want us to research a potential grant that could help them with their expansion. Um, heck, we've even been called to be asked to see if we could find a pickup truck for them to use in a parade. Thank you, Mike Alford, for that. <laughs> and they actually gave me the brand. And I asked them what color, and Mike stepped up to the plate. So um, we want them to call us first and, and uh, to help them. I will tell you that this year, year to date, um, we've certainly worked hard to enhance our business retention and expansion program. We've had over 40 site visits with our staff and over 200 interactions with our these 25 companies. Um, so we're very pleased with that program and, and uh, how that's coming. I will tell you also that of those 25 companies, we've actually seen a 10% in job growth over the last four years, as documented by talking to these companies just earlier this year. So we know they're growing. It's usually quiet, and sometimes it's not available for public um, uh, recognition, but they are growing, and, and we're very pleased with that. And we have several companies in this community that have been here a very long time. I believe it was uh, maybe last year that like, Stan and I celebrated 40 years here. You know, we've got Mind Safety Appliances and J&J and &J Snack Foods. They've all been here a very, very long time. So they enjoy doing business in Onslow County, and we want to make sure they continue to do so. Hopefully you saw the slideshow when you were coming in. We had some photos of some of our um, existing industries, and these are a few... Oops, wrong side. There we go. Chad probably saved me there. Um, a few more of our existing industries. So we're very, very pleased to um, have a, a good force here. Please go to our website and see our existing industry spotlights. We send that out to our investors on about a four to six week basis and it's, we truly do try to cover um, everything you wanted to know about one of our existing industries and they're all listed on our website. One of the other things we have learned um, in our uh, work in trying to promote Jacksonville and Onslow County is the number one challenge that we have, and this is, this is more recent than ever, and that's um, workforce. Uh, that challenge is across the state and across the country. And although Onslow County is the 12th largest county in the state of North Carolina, we still can have a tendency to get lost in the demographic searches from companies looking for a place to land because they wanna make sure they have the population from which to draw their workforce. So we've discovered that we certainly need to market ourselves on the regional basis, another benefit of being with the Southeast and, North and, and East Alliance. 
But we also want to show them that as their employers are considering employees' travel distances, I have found that slides such as this says the picture. Within about a 50-mile radius of Jacksonville, there's 735,000 people. And that doesn't tip into Wilmington. That's just snagging the north ends of Wilmington. So we are really, we're larger than many people think. And in addition to that, it gives us an opportunity to talk with them about our transitioning military. Uh, nearly 7,200 people a year now coming out, and we're working really hard with the base to continue to you know, qualify those transitioning Marines' skills so that we can basically sell that as an asset to locating in Oslo County in eastern North Carolina. So do I think we're producing results? I do. This is year to date. We've had 62 RFIs, and an RFI to us is not a light inquiry. This is a bona fide, credible lead that we're getting from our partnership uh, with the state, we're getting from one of our regional partnerships, or that we've probably generated ourselves, or could possibly come from maybe Duke Energy or some other economic development um, developers. So 62 RFIs to date, I think, stands pretty well with even some of the regional numbers that we're seeing. We have 11 active projects, and by 11 active projects, I mean these are bona fide, credible companies that have either been here to visit with us, we've been to visit with them, and we've had some long-term interaction with them. Now, granted, one of those is about six and a half years old, guys, but it's still an active project. <laughs> um, but they are very, very bona fide projects. Um, and five of those actually are actually um, attached to potentially considering the shell building. I've been here to see it at least once. Mm -hmm. um, and we've had 13 site visits or meetings, which actually is for eight of those projects. And I think that's pretty good in a year-to-date situation so far. So we are very busy, very active, and um, marketing Jacksonville and Onslow County. We continue to um, try to tell the story. Because as everybody knows, you've got to get them here in order to be able to sell them. So a few more accomplishments I wanted to share with you over the last four years. You know, we did in the last four years become an NC Works certified work ready community. We had our first industrial development fund grant. That was the one that we used to extend the road. We had our first North Carolina Department of Commerce building reuse grant. And that's opened up a door that I believe we're going to be able to travel down many times. Thank you, commissioners, because that was a recent grant. Um, we had our first, with the selling of Shell Building Number 1, that I can find on record, first Oslo County incentive that was actually awarded. Uh, we've just recently had a um, historic uh, opportunity in Holly Ridge, as they have, I believe, just first approved their first incentive offer. Holly Ridge Group, back. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for stepping up to the plate as the town. It's good to see you all. Thank you, Mayor Dingler. Appreciate that. Um, and uh, let's see, during this four years, many of you know, because I talk about it all the time, but of course we've recruited Armstrong Marine, which is now U.S. work boats, down to the old um, the Brunswick plant, Hatteras plant. And I hopefully all of you know that we have the first North Carolina passenger-only ferry under construction at that site right now. Very good. Very excited about that. A couple of the administrative things we did, of course, was we totally rebranded Joe Ed in the last four years, which is why everybody calls it Joe Ed now. It, makes, it shortens the name, but we branded that including a new website and totally gone to social media. Granted, I may have been drugged a little, but we are, we are totally engaged in social media now. So there's a few of the announcements. I have many more, but I know you all want to get out of here. So, um, Do we have any news? Everybody, the news media called early. They want to know if we had any you know, news that we were going to share. Can I trust you? No, no, okay, sorry. No, okay. Oh, sorry, my chairman just said no. Okay, so maybe I'll just like hint a little that in the next few weeks, because there was a couple things I just couldn't quite get done for today, regardless of how much of a control freak my husband says I am. But be on the lookout. I believe in the next few weeks that you might see an announcement of a potential new industry coming to Burton Park. Pretty sure you might hear about a potential new industry coming to Camp Davis Industrial Park. 
There you go again. Holler, Rich. <laughs> They've been working hard down there with Camp Davis. And I'm pretty sure I'll be able to make an announcement about some new industrial sites that are going to be developed in order to grow our marine trades industry in North Carolina. So as much as I would have loved to have said some things today, stay tuned. Pardon? Yeah, we'll stretch it out a little bit, John. Thank you. You know how to do this. I think the, the in final thought I want to share with you, we've come a long way. This program has grown. I believe your directors have got us on the right path, and they certainly have been pushing us. These four strategies came with a lot of action items, hundreds of action items that they have given the staff, and I think we've been trying to plow through them in order to get the results that you want. Bottom line is I think we're in a very good position, a good position to move forward, but there's way more to do, and I've totally emphasize that we are, this is a team effort. We need everybody in this room and everybody in Jacksonville and Onslow County to be a part of that team to help sell our community. And with that, I would make a very shameless plug that if you would like to become an investor in Joed, there's an application on your table. Please, please take it with you and send it in. I do want to thank you for your continued support. I want to thank um, our board of directors for their support. And I would not be finishing up a PowerPoint if I did not leave you with this constant thought, and that's economic development is a marathon. It is not a sprint. It's an endurance test. You have to hang in for the long run, always. With that, I would like to certainly thank the Joe Ed staff to help pull together today. We have Teresa Miller and Jeremy Schmidt in the back table. And on loan from the Chamber of Commerce, Tricia Purcell Heath, thank you all very much for the work you've done helping set us up today. I'd also like to... Um, I'd also like to give a special recognition to um, the Onslow County staff, uh, Randy Jones, David Bullock, Kelly Almeida, and Chad Ray. They're always excellent to work with, top notch, and have been tremendous to help us set this up today. And hopefully, on your way in or on your way out, you all will take one of the glasses wipes or screen wipes, depending on how old you are, is what you'll call it, um, with you as a little token of our appreciation today. With that, I'm going to go ahead and introduce our two speakers. Uh, to save time, I'll introduce both of them. And I'm going to ask you, if you could, to hold questions until after uh, Chris has finished speaking so that we can um, capture everything at one time. Frank Emery Jr. is with us today. Uh, and by the way, their very impressive uh, bios are in your program. I'm not going to read them. I'm just going to make a couple of personal comments. Uh, early last year, he was appointed by Governor Cooper to be the chairman of the board for the Economic Development Partnership of North Carolina. I was immediately impressed with how engaged and passionate Frank was for economic development, and especially rural North Carolina. I think you'll hear more about his plans in a moment, but I am especially appreciative of the fact that he has flown in today from Charlotte just for this lunch, and I really appreciate you coming to join us today, Frank. Thank you. Chris, of course, was here three years ago almost brand new on the job. Um, and when he was new, I'm going to embarrass him, I remember when he walked in the room after we hired him as a new board member, I looked and I said, oh, he's so young. <laughs> but he's not as young as he looks. And he had 20 years' experience under his belt. And we very quickly learned um, uh, how much he did know. He has continually amazed me at the breadth of his knowledge on a global basis and how well he can communicate that information. He's an incredible ambassador for the state of North Carolina. I am very impressed. I know you will be too if you've not heard from him before. Please help me welcome both of our special guests today. Uh, Sheila, thank you very much. I'm, I'm very glad to be here with you today. Um, I was struck by Sheila saying, you know, I flew in, that is true, but, you know, Sheila called, so I had to come. That's just how that worked. <laughs> I told the judge, I said, look, I can't, I can't be in court today. Miss Knight needs me in uh, Onslow County. Um, I thought what I'd do is a couple of things to tell you a little bit about me, a little bit about, or more about the partnership from the board level, and then talk to you about uh, some things I think that you would be, that it would be, no, let me, and I'll ask you for some help. Let me do it that way. Um, so uh, first about me quickly. So I'm, I'm also an Eastern North Carolina boy. I grew up in Wilson County. And so, you know, what I like to say is there are 99 good counties and one great county in North Carolina. And you can figure out which one that is. Uh, but I grew up coming down here. Um, so I know Camp Lejeune and, and uh, 
Jacksonville generally. One of my best friends from law school is from Richland. He called it the land, but from Richland. So I've been down here. Uh, I think I remember some of those days. We were in our 20s then. Uh, <clears throat> but in any event, uh, so I, I know this area. What I know about Eastern North Carolina is this. Uh, lots of smart people. People have great work ethic. Um, and there's a can-do spirit in this part of North Carolina that I'm proud of and uh, that I think we do. And I'll say this later, but I'll say again, I think our biggest impediment is that we don't know how to brag well. Uh, and so, you know, our, our natural southern understatement means that sometimes we don't tell our story as, as, as well as we should. The partnership. Um, so, um, uh, the, you may know the partnership was, was begun in 2014. North Carolina is one of 17 states that has a private uh, nonprofit that does the sales and marketing for its state. Um, there are three key reasons why that this works, I think. One, because as a private entity, we can and do employ private personnel policies uh, for incentivizing people and also for other personnel actions that you can't do in state government. <clears throat> uh, importantly, also, you have continuity. When you have a private company, um, for example, the person in Chris's role um, you know, remains whether, you know, whoever's in the governor's office. And so you can continue the strategy and to continue to move uh, it forward. And then we have a uh, uh, the ability to do private fundraising. And as a result of that, that those private funds allow us some um, flexibility. Again, and we have some performance-based uh, compensation for our people. We can't do that with state funds, so we do that with private funds. And so those, those those three aspects, I think, give us some, some real advantages. The board has 17 slots, uh, eight uh, appointed by the General Assembly, nine by the governor, and as Sheila pointed out, I'm the, um, uh, a gubernatorial appointee. Uh, our, our, our mission statement looks exactly, exactly like Joe, uh, Joe has, except for the state. Um, so we look at um, increasing key business activity. Uh, we do travel and tourism, and as you may know, North Carolina is the sixth uh, most visited state uh, in the country. Um, I'd like for us to be number one, but we're right now number six. Uh, and we, do, of course, do international exports and trade, and that's something we do a lot of work on. And in a community like this, international uh, is, is an important piece. Um, Chris, I'm sure we'll talk a bit more about the specifics of our results, but let me just tell you that year over year over year, uh, our, our uh, actual results in jobs and other uh, metrics have gone up. Uh, and 2017 was no, no exception. Indeed, we had an outstanding year in 2017 in terms of jobs recruited, jobs uh, uh, retained, uh, as well as foreign direct investment and business expansion. So uh, you're, you're, there are lots of achievements, lots of things that you can be proud of um, uh, in what, we, what we've been able to do. I brought some notes because I can talk without notes, but I can't stop talking without notes. <laughs> so I wanted to make sure that I that I left time for my colleague. Um, <clears throat> when we talk about statistics, um, you know, those are important, and that is how we, we are measured by the legislature, and that's how we measure Chris and his team. Um, and as I said, we've had a very strong year. But there's something to think about. You know, there's, there's a difference between outputs and outcomes. And uh, what I've been saying to our group is let's focus on outcomes. I mean, in other words, I can, you know, we can talk about a thousand jobs and that's a great thing. Don't get me wrong. I'm always glad to hear about new jobs, but there are jobs and then there are jobs. And what we want to do is ensure that the kind of economic activity that we help uh, entities like Joed and other to bring, that they're the kind of jobs that help people have more money in their pockets, uh, that they have a brighter economic future, and they're the kind of things that can draw other economic activity into the area. So we're looking for good outcomes uh, uh, from, from the state level. And one of the things, frankly, again, you know, given where I grew up, I have a keen interest and understanding of this, and that is, you know, that it is, it is often the case that in our 80, or depending on how you do it, either 80 or 85 rural counties in North Carolina, that young people decide that to do well, they must leave. And I'd like very much for that not to be the case. Uh, and I like very much for us, and that's, and that's something I think that we are all working on together, is to figure out how we can increase the opportunities uh, for people who grow up uh, in, in, in some of our counties so they don't have to leave. And more importantly, that we can attract others to come uh, and to stay and to invest uh, and to have a good quality of life. And so to that end, uh, to working on that, uh, the board, uh, you know, Sheila is a big part of this and, and many others, um, you know, we, uh, we, we're having this uh, summer, July 12 and 13, a, uh, a conference uh, that's going to be called um, Energizing Rural North Carolina. 
It's going to be at Pinehurst um, in Moore County. Um, and our co-sponsors uh, are, of course, the North Carolina Department of Commerce, uh, the Institute for Emerging Issues, the Gold Leaf Foundation, and the Rural Institute. And there are a number of others out there. But the idea is to get folks uh, together in a room. And let me be clear, we're not saying we're from Cary and we know all the answers. What we're saying is we want to convene people who've been in this field a while, because this isn't new. Lots of people have been thinking about rural economic development, but we thought it would be useful to come, come at it, not just from a policy perspective, but focus on an economic development uh, aim. Because if you think about it, um, let's just take 80 as the number. If, if, if all 80 or most of the 80 counties that are rural, if they can increase their economic output by just 10%, look at what that does for the state as a whole. Look at what that does for our ability to attract new business. And more importantly, look at what that does for our ability to retain the, the, the really uh, good talent that we grow here every day. Uh, we organ it's going to be organized around five building blocks, education, infrastructure, health and health care, workforce support and training, and leadership. Um, and that last one I, I want to emphasize, so leadership. I look around this room. All these people here uh, who are in elected offices and volunteer offices, you know, there's a brain trust in this room. A community cannot uh, thrive without the kind of brain trust and effort and in interest that you all have here. Well, that's, that's, that's the vital thing. I grew up in 4-H, and so one of the things we talked about in 4-H was to make the best better, right? And so the, the, our, our, our aspiration always has to be whatever it is we did yesterday is not as good as what we're, where we need to be tomorrow. And so we need to push each other in that way. And so the teamwork from um, the uh, EDP and C, the regional organizations like this one, to local chambers, always has to be, we have to be accountable to each other. Are we doing as much as we can do in, ev in every one of these areas? You might want to know, well, so from our statewide perspective, uh, where do things stand in North Carolina? What is our outlook? Um, I'm proud to tell you that I think it's very bright. I do. I think, you know, and I, I recognize that I am biased and I'm a North Carolina guy, and I think that this is as good a state as any and better than most to be in. That said, uh, we do have some challenges, and I want to talk to, uh, talk to you about a few of those. And I don't think any of these will be new, but let's, let's go over them. You know, we've had some uh, uh, public policy controversies in our state that made the news. Uh, those things affected our ability to attract uh, uh, business. Now, whichever side of those you're on, they just did. We didn't get the best press that we need. Those controversies, for the most part, are behind us, but they're still visible in the rearview mirror. And so we still get asked about some of those things, and we just have to say where we are, and, and you know, where we are, and Chris and his team do this, we're forthright about it, you know? Um, and we talk about the positives, we talk about who we are, where we are, and what we have to offer. And we've been successful uh, and continue to be successful in having people stay and having people come. Uh, the other thing, uh, again, I talked about making our best better. Well, the other folks, the other states are doing the same thing. Uh, and, you know, the competition has intensified. Other states are really serious about this. Uh, Tennessee, who used to be, we didn't even, they weren't even on the, on the radar screen for a while. You know, they've decided they're a state, too, <laughs> and they're out there trying to, <laughs> trying, trying to get business from us. Uh, I, I mentioned them. I hope nobody in here is from Tennessee. <laughs> um, but, but, yeah, but so, so we think about that. Uh, they, they've upped their game, so we must continue to do that. Um, the other thing is, I mean, you know, from time to time, I think we have not worked as well as we could as a statewide team. Um, and, and by that I mean, and, and Sheila talk, talked about that a lot, and I'm going to embarrass her in just a second to talk about this a little bit, but in, term, in, in this way, okay, so EDPNC is the statewide organization, then there are regional organizations like this one, then there are local organizations, and then there are local elected officials. We all need to be on the same page. I want to say that again. We all need to be on the same page. As someone said recently, we can make the podium as wide as it needs to be when we're making an announcement. We can get everybody on the podium. That's not the problem. We need not to be pointing at each other. We need to figure out how we can work together. So, you know, what we say, and Chris is really good about this internally, we don't really care who gets the credit. In fact, it's just great if nobody knows EDP and C was involved. What we want to do is have a win. Because if you get a win in Jacksonville, that's, you know, people in Brevard or in Asheville may not understand why that's important, but when, when, when Onslow County is strong, that makes 
uh, Asheville strong because we are a better, stronger state and a stronger economy. That's just how it is. I'll tell, um, we've got to get better at telling our story, um, better at talking about North Carolina for what it is. I mean, we can tick off a lot of things. I mean, we've got a great university system. We've got wonderful people. We've got, you know, this huge military presence in our state. Uh, we've got a financial center. We've got all these things. And we can talk about those in general, but we've got to get better at talking about North Carolina as a package deal and quit well, now, let me go ahead and say it. Y'all know me now. So, and we have to quit competing internally with each other. So let me be plain what I mean by that. So, you know, sometimes people will say, well, gosh, you know, if something happens good in Wilson, that's somehow going to take something away from Charlotte. Other than me leaving Charlotte, I think that'll be okay. That's not an issue. That should not be an issue. We, you know, Charlotte doesn't compete with um, Onslow County. Mecklenburg County doesn't meet, compete with Onslow County generally for most kind of developments. We should be trying to help Onslow County grow. Um, tier one doesn't compete typically with tier three. You know, if Charlotte's competing with somebody, it's probably Atlanta it's probably, or, or um, Austin or somewhere like that. So, but, but when we do this right, what we understand is this. Every large metropolitan area has an ecosystem of many counties around it. And I'll just take a, take a, take a page out of the book where I live. So in Charlotte, 52% of the people who work in Charlotte live in other counties. So if those counties are not healthy, there's no workforce for Charlotte. And if those counties aren't healthy, there's nobody to buy the things that the folks in Charlotte sell. In my office, uh, my, my law office, many of the people who work in my law office in Charlotte, you know, again, live outside. So we gotta have good roads for them, we gotta have you know, good places for them to eat lunch, and, they're, and, they, and they need to have places where their kids can go to school, all those things. So we've got to get really good at telling our story. I said I was going to embarrass, embarrass Sheila, and now here that is. So I don't know that I've been to a, a, a meeting about economic development in this state where she wasn't there. Um, I'm really serious about that. I don't know that that's true. You know, and so you know, people like Sheila Knight who uh, get it, understand it, are dug in personally and professionally and work hard, you know, and she, she's as big a cheerleader for other counties as she is for here. I want to say that again. She's as big a cheerleader for other parts of the state as she is for here, and you all who know her here know how big a cheerleader she is for here. Now, you, when you meet her, you know where she's from. She will let you know that pretty quick, um, and that's, that's important. But what I'm trying to say is teammates like her is what makes this effort go well. You mentioned, she mentioned Chris Chung, and he's going to speak to you in just a minute. So uh, Chris is a phenomenal uh, spokesperson for our state. Um, he is a, an honest broker. People respect him. He tells the truth. Um, and he's enthusiastic about what he's doing. His, his staff respects him. His board respects him. And the people in the legislature know who he is. And so I want you to know when I talk about where we are, you've got a great team of people working with you. And I think of all of you as part of that team. So I'll end this part simply by saying this. Please be sure not to miss an opportunity to talk about your area, but also your state. You're on vacation, and somebody says, where are you from? Tell them where you're from. Um, we got any Baptists here? Any Baptists in this room? OK, so y'all know a little bit about evangelizing, right? OK. <laughs> You've been to a revival before. You know what that's like? OK, well, we need to be like folks that just left revival when we were out uh, looking for new business and retaining business for our state. At EDPNC, we have several offices. Uh, we, we try to focus on some key audiences, site selection professionals and consultants, companies, of course, that we want to recruit, the companies we want, we want to help expand, state and local governments, and local and regional, regional chambers and partnerships. So if you think about all those areas, we try to touch all of those folks and to be a resource for all of those areas. In my mind, there are three keys to being successful at economic development. Um, uh, I call them the three I's. The first one is intellect, a trained and trainable workforce. So I know I met the president of your community college here, uh, here today, but you know, we've got a great community college system here in our state, our university system and the private universities, and also K-12, don't forget that. Because when you recruit a business or you want to retain a business, I can tell you most times that conversation starts with, tell me about your school system. Because those folks, don't, they hire workers, but human beings show up. And they have families and they have children. And they want their children to be able to do well. The second one is investment. Um, yes, taxes. 
we've got to pay some to get some things. And, you know, I, I pay quarterly. I understand what that means. I don't enjoy it. But, you know, we, we recognize that as our state grows, we need to make sure that we do invest. Incentives, um, we have to use incentives uh, to, to get and retain businesses. Uh, I'm not naive. I recognize that this, you know, if, 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 you weren't, if we weren't already in that business, maybe we wouldn't do incentives. But if everybody with, with, against whom we compete is in the incentives business and we don't use them, we're going to be behind. And so we have to be in that business. And then I mentioned earlier civic engagement. You all have that here in spades. But we have to make sure that the business community and the political community are, are tied in and, and, and tough with that. And then infrastructure. And you all understand infrastructure. You were talking about buildings and land. Um, whether it's transportation or energy, natural gas, electricity, water. Um, consistent regulations and public policy uh, to make sure that we are business friendly, that it doesn't take four weeks to get something done. I'm in the middle of a, uh, at home at a, a middle of a, a, a remodeling project, which may end this century, I hope. And every time I'm, I come home and say, why didn't this happen? Well, we're waiting on a permit. And I just think, surely that can go faster. Um, so just a public plug for, for to my elected officials here to try to make those things go better. Uh, Health care. Health care is certainly an inf a big piece of infrastructure. And I, I learned today during, while we were, we were visiting about a very, a very uh, novel uh, cooperation that you all are, are working on with your local, your county hospital and the, uh, and the uh, medical facilities on the, on the base uh, about how you, each, each, each party is doing what it does best to, to provide uh, great health care. That's a wonderful thing. That's the kind of teamwork, I think, that will make, uh, continue to make you successful. And then an educated political and business class, what I call the closers. And what by that I mean, every now and then, you know, you have somebody and they're on the fence about it. You need to be able to pick up the phone and call some of the people in this room and say, can you come to a dinner or come to a lunch and sit down and tell them why it is, remember revival, why it is they should come to your area. That matters because people like to talk to their peers. They know that we're in the business of selling, right? But when you were here and you said, why did you locate there? I located there because, and I've stayed because, that matters. So I hope you will, when, when um, Sheila and her colleagues and others call you, I hope you will pick up the phone and, and come running. So in sum, yeah, I think we're in great shape. I think we've got a wonderful state uh, to, uh, to sell. We've got a great, uh, great organizations to work together on, uh, on and with. And so I hope you uh, are as bullish about it as I am, uh, and that is that we, we, there's no reason we can't be even more successful in 18 than we were in 17, and 17 was a great year. Um, let me leave you with this. So um, I, I got this from Tom Friedman in a book he wrote. You know, every morning in Africa, a gazelle wakes up. It knows it must run faster than the fastest lion or it will be killed. Every morning, a lion wakes up. It knows it must outrun the slowest gazelle or it will be eaten and die. It doesn't matter whether you are a lion or a gazelle. When the sun comes up, you better start running. Thank you very much. Hello? Oh, there we go. Well, jeez. Stay near the podium for taping. Oh, sure. Okay. I didn't realize this was being taped. All right, very good. Uh, good afternoon, everyone. Thanks for having me. That is a hard act to follow. That's, uh, Frank is, uh, as you can see, a very energetic, passionate chairman of our board of directors. I appreciate the chance to be with you all again. Uh, as Sheila mentioned, you were all kind enough to invite me to be a speaker uh, about three years ago this time, uh, shortly after I took the reins in my current role. Uh, thank you for the invitation back. I'm glad I didn't say anything too offensive to anyone at the time and earned my way back here eventually. But uh, 
Uh, as someone who's lived here now three and a half years uh, in North Carolina, there's a few things that I've learned. As you can tell looking at my bio, I am not from North Carolina. Originally, I grew up in Columbus, Ohio, spent some time in St. Louis, and have been here since January of 2015. So there are a few things as a native, non-native North Carolinian you learn in three and a half years on the job. And you learn about some very controversial debates and arguments that go on around uh, North Carolina. Of course, there's the, the issue of which college basketball team you should cheer for. That's uh, an unsettled question for a lot of folks. Eastern North Carolina barbecue versus Western North Carolina barbecue. Also a very controversial subject, depending on where you are in the state. And of course, right here in Onslow County, the debate is Lejeune or Lejeune. As with the other two arguments, I'm going to feign neutrality on, on this issue as well. So um, with that, I, I'm going to dovetail a little bit with what Frank talked about. Uh, as you all know, if, if you've heard me speak before, I usually like to just start because so many people are still learning about our organization three and a half, four years into it, just very quickly what we do on behalf of the state of North Carolina. Then what I want to spend most of my time talking about are some of the trends and observations that we've seen working this at a staff level over the past year, 18 months, and then close it out with a brief video that I think you all uh, hopefully uh, will enjoy seeing. And I'll talk about that here in a second. As you all know from both Sheila's introduction as well as from Frank's remarks, we were created a few years ago to tackle a number of economic development duties on behalf of North Carolina. And there are very important economic development functions that any state should care about if they want to advance the economic well-being of their communities and their residents. I've been in economic development, uh, it'll be 21 years in September for me. Uh, I started as an intern at Ohio State uh, a long, long time ago and have spent time in three different states doing this type of work, Ohio, Missouri, now North Carolina for the past three and a half years. And throughout that time, my own understanding of economic development, of course, has evolved as I've spent each of my waking professional days doing this type of work. If you talk to a lot of people who do economic development full-time for a living, folks like Sheila, folks like Steve Yost, folks like John Chafee, uh, most of us in this profession would define economic development as the work of increasing the wealth of the community that you serve. Sheila, of course, serves the community called Onslow County. Steve serves a community called the Southeast region of North Carolina. And John serves the eastern region of North Carolina. Of course, the work that we're doing at the staff of the EDPNC is to serve this community called North Carolina. And so our job, really, every day is to think about ways we can increase the wealth of this community that we're serving through our work. But what does it mean to increase the wealth of a particular community? The example I always like to give is if this were our community right here, uh, there's probably, what, 120, 130 folks here in the room this afternoon. If we were trying to increase the wealth of this community of 130 people, how would we go about doing that? Would we be able to increase the wealth of this community if we never saw any new money or new economic activity come into this room from outside the room? No. The amount of money, if it's just the same circulating here within this room, if that never changes, you're not really increasing the wealth of the community. You're just moving the chairs around the deck. Someone gets richer at the expense of someone getting poor within this community. So really, when you think about economic development, it's fundamentally about how do you get new money and new economic activity coming in from the outside. That's the only way that you can really lift the overall wealth of the community as a whole. And so there's a lot of different ways you can try to attract, attack that concept. Recruiting a new company in from the outside, of course, is probably one of the best known ways to do that. When you attract a new employer in from outside of a community, that company is creating new jobs, new payroll, new investment in bricks and mortar. That's new money and new economic activity that's now being spent in that community that wasn't there before. Tourism, another great way for new economic activity to find its way into a community from outside. When someone comes and visits Surf City or Topsail Beach, when they come in from somewhere outside this county, and they spend money at a hotel or at a restaurant or even just filling up their car at the gas station, whatever it is that they're doing, when they come in and spend their money, they're leaving that economic imprint, that activity behind, and that's new money that finds its way into a community. And so that's why I like to describe economic development as this issue of trying to get new money flowing in, because it helps set up why we do what we do 
at the Economic Development Partnership of North Carolina. So really quickly, what do we do? As you heard Frank and Sheila both say, we are the state organization responsible for working business recruitment opportunities on behalf of the state. On any given day, our team is working on opportunities that involve manufacturers that are looking to locate in North Carolina, corporate headquarters that may be looking to relocate from where they are today to move to somewhere friendlier like North Carolina, could be a food manufacturer, could be a marine products manufacturer, could be a biotechnology company, but you get the picture. Those are the types of companies that we're in conversations with every single day of the year trying to talk about North Carolina and working with partners like Sheila at the local level and John and Steve at the regional level trying to make the sell that this is where those companies ought to locate versus allowing them to go somewhere like South Carolina or Tennessee or Georgia. Very important work, very high publicity work. Uh, I don't need to tell you all that when you're successful recruiting a new company in, that's a groundbreaking, it's a ribbon cutting, it's great headlines, and who doesn't love any of those things happening? That's what you get when you attract a new employer in from outside the community. Very, very important, but remember, it's very, very competitive. Every state is out there trying to recruit new industry. Every region and every county is out there trying to recruit new industry. It's very, very competitive. In any given year, we might have three or 400 at-bats trying to convince a company that hasn't yet decided where it wants to expand or locate, trying to get them to come here to North Carolina. Three or 400 jump balls where it's truly not a done decision where they want to go. At a state level, our odds aren't bad. One out of every 50, that's it's not great, it's not terrible, but there are 3,300 counties in this country. Now your odds get a little bit more uphill. If you're a city or a town, there's 19,000 of you out there across the US. That denominator just got that much bigger. The odds just that got that much longer. And so I say that to communities where I present because even though I come from the business recruitment side of economic development, I always want people to understand that business recruitment is just part of a well-balanced economic development strategy. It's not where all the eggs, it's not the basket where you should be putting all of your economic development eggs because one, it's really, really hard to get those successes. Uh, and two, there's also some other great ways you can get that new money flowing into your community from outside, other ways you can get economic development to happen. That's what allows me to talk about the other four issues uh, are there four strategies that we approach economic development with at a state level? Existing business support. You saw Sheila's slide earlier. There's, there's 25 companies that they are regularly in contact with here in the county. I'm guessing companies probably like US Workboat, Convergis, uh, j and Snack Foods, companies like that, which if you do a good job just staying in front of those companies, you don't have to convince those folks to come to Onslow County or to North Carolina because they're already here. They've chosen to be here or they started here. You don't need the fancy sales pitch. You just need to help them get rid of any barriers that may be preventing them from growing further or better yet, get them connected with some resources that can help them continue to grow and add jobs. That's what we do on a routine basis all around the state working oftentimes with local partners like Sheila, where we call on existing companies, we try to figure out what can we do to help that company grow even faster than what it might do. And that's important because, as we always like to say, there's a whole lot more companies that are already here today than the number of companies we could ever hope to recruit in any given year, no matter how successful the year. The numbers don't even compare. So even if just a fraction of those existing companies are able to expand because of something we've done or our partners have done to help them grow faster, that itself is going to yield a whole lot more new jobs and new investment than even the best possible year we could have recruiting new companies into the state. Third thing, international trade and export assistance. When you all heard me speak a few years ago, this was also one of those things I like to talk about. 95% of the world's population sits outside the United States. So if you've got a good product or service to sell, you've got plenty of customer opportunities sitting outside this US market of ours. We do our work at a state level to help a lot of those small and medium-sized companies try to reach, with, reach to and connect with new customers in markets like Asia, Europe, Latin America, the Middle East, Africa, and anywhere in between. Because we know that if we're successful helping those small and medium-sized companies, the new customers they make and more importantly, the new revenues they generate, most of those new revenues are gonna flow back here to those companies 
who make those products here in North Carolina. Again, another way for new money to find its way from outside of North Carolina back into the communities that make up North Carolina. Small business startup assistance, uh, we work on a 1-800 number that's staffed by four people and they field about 22,000 calls a year answering questions from individuals who want to start a new business somewhere here in one of our 100 counties. And our work in this area touches all 100 counties of the state. This could be an individual who wants to start a landscaping business. Maybe they want to start their own consulting firm after retiring. Maybe they just want to open up a cafe or a micro pub or something like that. If they've got those questions about starting a new business somewhere, we're providing some upfront assistance on permits, licenses, paperwork, any of those things that they need to get a proper start to their business. And then we work with folks like Ann Shaw at Coastal Carolina Community College and other small business centers around the state to get these individuals hooked up with resources that can help them take that idea from a concept to execution. Very important because we hope that of those 22,000 individuals that we talk to every year, hopefully as many of those 22,000 folks are going on to form successful businesses. Maybe they only employ a couple people, but if they're really successful, maybe that grows to a couple dozen. If they're really successful, maybe they grow to a couple hundred sometime down the road. We're just there at the very beginning to try to give them some of that basic information they need to take those first steps in getting that business started. And then last but not least, tourism. Tourism is big business in North Carolina. You heard that uh, mentioned by Frank and Sheila both. In 2017, we saw about $24 billion of new visitor spending here in North Carolina, putting 200,000 plus North Carolinians to work every day in the tourism and hospitality industries. We're blessed with a great product. Mountains, coastline, golf courses, and a lot of other great stuff in between. But as you heard, it's not enough just to have a great product. You have to go out there and sell it. And so we're responsible at a state level for trying to get more potential travelers outside North Carolina aware of why they ought to plan their next vacation, why they ought to spend their money bring that money in from outside our state economy and drop it right here in North Carolina. That's what we do on the tourism side. So again, that's just a quick reminder of what we do. Now let me just talk very briefly about some of the things that we've observed in the past 12 or 18 months, or frankly, really since the last time I had a chance to address this group as a whole. One of the big things that we continue to see, and Sheila hit on this in her remarks, at the EDPNC, we're carrying an active project load right now, so we define it like any sales organization in terms of our pipeline. We've got about 300 active deals in our pipeline. These are everything from small expansions that existing companies are contemplating to an unnamed e-commerce company that's thinking about a second headquarters somewhere in the United States with a lot of jobs. That represents the spectrum of jobs that we are working, or spectrum of projects we're working with on a, a given basis. Now, Break that down into recruitment deals versus companies already here that we're helping to expand. And I'd say probably 60% of those are pure recruitment deals. They don't have anything here today. And we're trying to work with partners like Sheila, Steve, and John to get them to come to North Carolina and set up shop here. When we get contacted at a state level, and I'd say most of those deals are usually starting off, their first phone call happens to be the state. Uh, sometimes they'll contact regions, sometimes they'll even go directly locally, but most companies, they think it's generally easier to just go to a state organization. Maybe they'll call the governor's office or they'll call the commerce secretary. Either way, however that comes into North Carolina, it finds its way to us very quickly. What we consistently have found since the three and a half years that I've been on the job is that as you heard Sheila say, 75% of those deals that involve companies uh, that were, are looking in North Carolina are looking for an existing building to move into. Doesn't mean that's ultimately where they end up, but when we ask them what the real estate requirements are that are driving their decision, they tell us we need, we want a vacant building. They think it'll save them time. They think it'll save them money if they can get a good deal on an empty building. And so as you heard Sheila say, the communities that struggle with that are the ones that don't have any product available to put in front of that company. A community that doesn't have a vacant building, by definition, isn't going to last very long in that conversation with those companies, those 75% of companies who come in asking to be in a vacant building. You may have the best workforce, you may have a great location off the highway, you may have rail service, you may have low energy costs, whatever it is, if you don't have that real estate component, that's a 
good way to get eliminated right off the bat. And unfortunately, we see too many communities, oftentimes rural communities, who fail to get even beyond that first conversation simply because of lack of product. And so I was really encouraged. Sheila organized a dinner with some of her board members last night. We just had a good conversation about some of the things they're doing here in Onslow County. And I'm very encouraged anytime I see a community have the foresight to invest in putting a spec building up because at a minimum, at least you're gonna be able to compete for a lot more deals than you might if you don't have any vacant buildings to show. And I think proof positive is some of the statistics that Sheila showed you earlier today. I think you said something like 40% of the deals you're competing for, you may, may not have been able to compete for if you didn't have an empty building to offer. So I think product, product, product is one of those things we often want to remind our local partners of because as John and Steve can both tell you, they probably see something similar. Three out of every four, three out of every five deals, companies looking for that empty building. We certainly see that at state level. We always want to encourage communities that if they have the resources, if they have the vision, and if they have the local leadership to put together those resources, it's not a bad idea to invest in something that's gonna be able to get companies to come take a look. The companies that Sheila is showing that spec building to, they may not ultimately move into that spec building if they choose Onslow County, but that's probably the reason they came here in the first place, and it gives you an additional chance to make the sale and convince them why this is the place to be. If they never come here in the first place, you're gonna be really hard pressed to get that company to come here. So that's one thing that I think is worth bearing. The second is we've seen an enormous uptick in foreign direct investment opportunities over the past 18 months especially. Uh, and when I say foreign direct investment, I'm just talking about foreign owned companies that are looking to expand into the United States by setting up a new operation. For us, a lot of that time, uh, that's usually a manufacturing entity of some sort. We've gone from roughly one out of every four recruitment deals that we're working involving a foreign owned company to now one out of every three deals the past 18 months. That's a fairly sizable increase when you think about it. And as I was telling the group last night at dinner, Really, my own theory for a lot of this is that, one, the U.S. remains a, a really attractive market. I mean, we are a huge consumer market. If you're a global company, of course you want to try to tap into the U.S. market and all of its consumption power. You want to sell to the customers here in the United States. Well, go back 18 months, and now there starts to be talk about trade barriers, trade policies, dropping out of international trade agreements potentially levying a border tax on companies who sell into the US from outside, raising tariffs on certain products. You can imagine if you're sitting in Tokyo or Munich or London or Dubai, if you've got a company that sells into the US or wants to sell into the US today, well, all of a sudden, some of these things that they're hearing out of Washington DC may make you think, gosh, you know what? It might, might be a little harder in the future if we want to sell into the U.S. And boy, we don't want to miss out on that opportunity to sell into such a huge economy and a huge marketplace. And so what that probably is leading to is a lot of companies who are hedging their bets. We, we still don't know where D.C. is going to end up on this stuff, right? I mean, no one can tell that, but we know that the signals are there, that there's probably going to be a little bit more protectionism, which is a whole separate discussion itself. But for the companies sitting outside the United States, they're thinking, all right, maybe now is a time where we ought to at least hedge our bet, take a little more serious look at doing something in the United States, localizing manufacturing, localizing production, doing something so that if there are trade barriers that get erected, how do we bypass those by having made in the US and ways where we can get around some of those policies? And I think, at least from where we sit, that's probably driving a lot of the behavior that's causing now one out of every three of our recruitment deals to be involving a foreign owned company. We've even had some companies anecdotally tell us that's exactly what it is. I can't speak for all of them, but if a few of us are telling us that, it's probably plausible that that's what's motivating a lot of these other companies. And so all I would say is that as you look at what to do in Onslow County, remember that the opportunities to compete to get companies here they long ago stopped being just about convincing other American companies. It's increasingly a truly global economy when it comes to economic development and specifically business recruitment. A lot of those deals that Sheila is competing for here locally, chances are a good number of those are also foreign owned companies as well. So let me wrap up with a couple of things here. Um, Frank said it very well, you all are ambassadors for the community that you live in. 
Uh, as I always like to tell groups as well, don't forget that and don't take that responsibility lightly. As Frank said, when you step on a plane going somewhere, when you're at a conference somewhere, even when you're on vacation somewhere, what you say about this town that you call home, you never know how that's going to affect some business owner's decision, some potential tourist or visitor's decision about what they think and what they feel about this place that you call your home community. So don't take that lightly. And remember that when you put the best possible face on what it's like to live, work, and do, uh, do business here in Onslow County, that can make a difference when you're sitting somewhere outside this community. Second is, as we always say when we speak to groups like this, please support the efforts of your local economic development organization. Uh, we have a dedicated, energetic, well-connected, passionate board of directors, as you heard from our chairman. We have a staff that I hope rises to that same level in terms of its passion and competence. We can only move the ball so far down the field. We depend absolutely on a lot of partners, ton of private sector partners, a lot of regional groups, but especially local economic development organizations. Sheila has been great for more reasons than I have time to enumerate. She's been a great board member, very supportive, really involved in shaping policy on economic development. But when it comes to the brass tacks of taking care of those companies that we're trying to recruit or get to expand, we can't do our work at a state level without those well-resourced, professional, well-supported partners doing this locally in the community. So I know I'm preaching to the choir at settings like this, but I don't know what the rest of this community feels. And so you're also ambassadors to some extent for having a well-supported, well-resourced local economic development effort. And I hope you'll continue to advocate for a local economic development organization that's worthy of the community that you call home. So before we get into questions, let me just take 60 seconds here. I'm gonna ask Chip to queue up the video here. I talked about tourism being a huge economic driver for North Carolina. We do a lot of advertising. Half of our $25 million a year budget, actually more than half, is focused on running marketing campaigns outside of North Carolina, aimed at getting potential visitors to come here, bring their economic activity, bring their money, and spend it here in our state. Uh, you won't see these on your local TV station. Uh, no offense, you're not our target audience. You already know how great it is to visit North Carolina. These are for folks in Atlanta, Nashville, Pittsburgh, Cleveland, Columbus, Washington, DC. Some of these places we're running these ads at this moment, trying to show them the beautiful things and wonderful experiences that people can have when they come visit North Carolina. This new 60 second spot started about a month ago. And if we can start it's to turn the, the sound up. that stay with us. Your first kiss. Your first car. I wonder if there's a waterfall up there. That time you came in first place. These moments make our hearts race. Our Jeez. eyes widen. Anytime like that's so cool. Our hands sweat. The lines of our smiles deepen in our cheeks. These firsts shape us and forever set the bar for all other moments. The magic of experiencing something for the very first time never gets old. Come, experience firsts that last in North Carolina. So this is a new campaign. No, oh, thanks, yeah. <laughs> First, that last, really just talking, encouraging travelers to come here and experience some first that they've never done before. The, the folks you saw in that commercial, not paid actors. These are people who come from Brooklyn, Columbus, Ohio, and Atlanta who'd never seen a waterfall before, who'd never seen the ocean before. That, that's the, the young mother and her child from Columbus, Ohio. And I can attest to growing up in Columbus, Ohio, it takes you a while to get to see the ocean. It's not like when you live here in North Carolina. It's just a couple hours away and then a couple, in Atlanta, uh, a couple in Brooklyn who'd never tasted moonshine before. So we filmed them. <laughs> hey, that's North Carolina for you. So. And so we filmed them in places like Kerala and places like uh, Sliding Rock out uh, in DuPont State Park out in Western North Carolina, just experiencing these things for the first time. And so that's on our website, visitnc.com. Feel free to post it to your Facebook or social media feeds and hey, show the rest of the world why it's a great place to come and visit. So with that, I'll turn it back over to Joey, and if we've got time for questions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Chris.
thank you both so much for being here. At this time, we, we do have some time for a little Q&A. If you have, folks have questions for either Frank or Chris, I would ask that you just raise your hand. We, we are taping this. We have microphones, so we'll bring the microphone to you just so we can get your question on tape. But if you have questions, just uh, stand up, raise your hand. We'll get that mic to you. Wait a minute, wait a minute. The one person who told me, make sure you get them on microphone, and, and she's not going to use it? I'm going to put them on the spot and go ahead and ask the question that everybody in this room has about the 800-pound gorilla in North Carolina. Which one of you wants to field that and just get it off the table right now? Those I don't know what the question is. Are you, are you talking about the governor? No. Uh, <laughs> was asking about the uh, HQ2 search for Amazon. Well, I, I, as hopefully everyone can appreciate and respect, that's an ongoing project, so we don't, we don't talk about ongoing projects. But I think that's a good case study for just how important uh, talent continues to be. And you heard that multiple times today. Amazon's requirement just happens to be a couple zeros larger than most of the companies we talk to on a routine basis, 50,000 positions. Talent, I mean, we're in a tight economy. It's a good economy, which means that it's an employee's market. It means employers have to fight harder to recruit and retain the talent they need to be successful. And so things that you're able to do with your community colleges, things that you're able to do with transitioning active duty military personnel into the private sector, these are all strategies that I think states and communities have to make the best of to ensure that when a company comes knocking, you can demonstrate to them that the talent exists in whatever market you serve to meet their demands. So. Um, that's, that's how I'd address that question uh, while dodging the actual question itself. Could you address the challenge of broadband infrastructure in rural North Carolina? Uh, I'll start. Uh, thank you for that question. Um, it's critical. Uh, I see, and, and we see broadband today like we saw electricity you know, 7,500 years ago. Um, and I think if we, don't, if we don't figure that out, we're not gonna be in the game. Um, I can't be any clearer than that. So I think, and, I don't, and it's gotta be high, high level broadband, not only for residential, but for businesses. So yes, and, we're, and, we, and that's something that we're, we're working on and trying to think and, and looking for solutions to do. Uh, some of you know it's a little bit political um, and there are folks who have views about it, but uh, at least in, in my view, and I think from our, our board members share this, that this is something that we've got to be very serious about, uh, making it, in essence, a, a, not in essence, making it available all the way across our state. Yeah, I mean, I, I would echo that. Uh, besides Joey's story earlier that Martin County discovered wireless broadband <laughs> 300 years ago, um, all, all that kidding aside, I mean, broadband access, of course, helps to recruit companies because mo pretty much every company depends on high-speed telecommunications connectivity. It helps your existing companies grow. We just helped a company out in Macon County in far western North Carolina, Shaw Industries, with an expansion that they otherwise couldn't have done if they hadn't figured out some way to get broadband to their facility. It even helps for a lot of entrepreneurs. I know in Carteret County, you've got some companies, I think in Emerald Isle, uh, the transportation logistics firm that has said that one of their growth constraints is they'd love to hire more people to do their logistics business, but they gotta have that high-speed broadband. So as Frank said, it, it's absolutely critical to a lot of these different dimensions of economic development. Thank you, Jeremy. Um, great job, guys. Um, to this to you, Chris. Um, Frank may join in, but uh, so you, Sheila, and I were all in IMC together just recently. And the Toyota Group was there represented by their site location consultant, JLL, and a representative from Toyota. And one of the things they mentioned about that site search was at the very last phase, talent was a big item for them, and that they put on their agenda for the Japanese when they came in to go into the high schools to have a conversation about talent development beginning earlier in the process than we've historically thought about that. Would you address that topic as well? 
uh, of, of how Toyota conducted search or just the notion of getting high schoolers exposed to just manufacturing? That, just that evolution of companies are now looking and saying, what are you doing in your K-12 system? To oh, sure. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, at our most recent board uh, meeting in Wilson, uh, we heard from the Wilson Academy for Applied Technology. It's an innovative program where manufacturers have partnered with the local high school for an early college slash manufacturing uh, training program for sort of upperclassmen at a, of a high school age. Uh, I think you're seeing more of that. I think, Sheila, you told me last night you've got a four-county effort here for a, a technical education center, uh, technical education high school, or three-county effort. Um, I, Many of you probably know this because I suspect workforce comes up all the time in these discussions. Getting younger people to consider careers in manufacturing, where some of these skill, technical skill shortages are in, um, in most high demand, uh, that's still challenging. Uh, we, we all know this. I mean, it feels like we say it so often it's become cliche, but we still know we fight this perception of modern manufacturing environments as being dirty, dangerous, uh, not pleasant places to work, when the reality is more and more, if not most, manufacturing operations are much more advanced, dependent on computing, robotics, safe, well-lit places. But how do you overcome that in the perception of young kids who are deciding what to do for a living when they grow up? How do you overcome that with their parents who may think that their only choice is to send their child to a four-year traditional university? How do you overcome that with guidance counselors and teachers and others who also influence what a young person decides to do with his or her life? Uh, I know that there are community colleges around the state that are now going in to recruit high school students for manufacturing and industry-specific training tracks. I mean, it, this is not an issue that's going to go away because manufacturing, hopefully, will not go away in the U.S., which means there's going to be certain skills that we're always going to need. We just have to figure out how to cultivate them earlier and earlier on. So that's what I'd say. Not nothing to add. <clears throat> I got a, a quick question on a lighter note, and this hits at home with Frank. From a business retention and tourism standpoint, what's the current winds on our endeared Panthers staying in Charlotte and not leaving us in Mr. Tepper? It's a tough room. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, the, the latest uh, reported in the Observer and confirmed by all the gossip in the barbershop is that um, uh, we, 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 they actually have identified a buyer, uh, Mr. Tepper, and uh, the, the latest word is that uh, he, you know, he intends to keep the team uh, in Charlotte, uh, in North Carolina and in Charlotte or the Charlotte area. Uh, so, you know, there really is a cascade of questions. First is who buys it, then it's whether they're going to keep it here. And then the next one is about the stadium. The stadium is 22 years old and got to figure out what they want to do with all of that. Um, and uh, what I'm learning, I'm, you know, I, don't, I don't play in the billionaire game, I'm, uh, but, but what I understand is there's, there's always some negotiating about what the public is, plan is interested in or willing to invest in, the, in, this, uh, in, in this shared uh, benefit of the of this team. Um, but but the, all, all of the signs, I think I, I can say this with some confidence, all of the signs are that we will continue to have a team. It will be located in Charlotte. Um, and that, you know, now whether this, you know, and how long they stay in that stadium is another question. But that, th those are the early signs now, you know. Anything you all can do to urge that that happen, you know, would be great. Uh, but, I, but I think that's right. Real quick, the, uh, the partnership that was created in 2014, is that correct? Is it working uh, relative to competitiveness and the flexibility to, <clears throat> to get incentives in such a way that we can compete effectively with South Carolina and Tennessee and the other, maybe Texas, well, Alabama? Fr from my standpoint, I think, you know, the, the selection of the board chair has been just pivotal. <laughs> <laughs> That, that's true locally, too, Frank. <laughs> no, just, uh, in all seriousness, um, you know, I, um, I, I think the, so as I move around the state without this guy standing next to me, and I move around and I talk to people, uh, uniformly there's enthusiastic support for the partnership and what it does and the way it does. Uh, a lot of that has to do with the personality, but I think it also, ha I mean, with the person in involved and the people, but I think a lot of it also has to do with the fact that people feel like, again, there's this um, continuity and, a pro and, and professionalism that you wouldn't otherwise get. 
Um, I think that you know we're we're um, it's still early days, uh, and I think there are some ways we can be even better. But in terms of the the professional class of folks, your peers from around the, the country, when they talk to me, and I know I have to filter some of it out because I have on a name badge that says EDPNC, but I, I get the impression that they feel like North Carolina is doing a good job uh, in, in, this, in this arena. Do you have a different view at all? <laughs> no, I'll, I'll piggyback. Uh, look, I, I'll be the first one. There's plenty of room for us to improve as an organization. We are still young. Uh, so there's a lot of stuff that we try to do better. Sheila, in addition to sitting on our board, also sits on something we call our Economic Development Advisory Council. These are 16 uh, economic developers from all across North Carolina that we use a sounding, as a sounding board for things that we can be doing even better or differently in a way that's going to help us be a better partner to our local uh, allies. Um, any of you who are baseball fans, there's a, a saber metric called wins above replacement. It's basically if you substitute this player out and substitute substitute a different player in under the same scenario, how much likely or less likely are you to win a game or have a different outcome? I wish there were a way to do that for economic development. The, the reality is there's no, there's no way we could ever compare our organization, the way it's set up, and how we do in the same exact period of economic years to a previous model or a different model. There's just no way to run that comparison. I wish there were. I feel very confident that we would hold up very well in that, but what we just have to do is keep focusing on driving the best possible performance results. That's how Frank and our board hold us accountable. It's how our private investors hold us accountable. It's how the governor and the legislature hold us accountable. We had a, a record year for us last year, uh, and I think that year was, was the best in about a decade uh, that the state has ever seen in terms of announced recruitment and expansion jobs. Um, but that's not good enough. Uh, you know, you heard Frank say it, 17 was good, let's try even better in 18. So that's the standard we're going to hold ourselves to, is just try to do better than we did the year before. Now, on the other, in addition, you know, we play, let's, let's keep the game analogy going. We play in a stadium, and the stadium we're playing in has to do with the incentives and the way it works that the legislature provides uh, and, and, and local policies and things like that and state policies. And so, you know, there, you know, there are uh, valid policy disagreements about how we do that as a state, and I think we, we're still evolving through that piece as well. Um, so I'd say within the, within the structure we've got, I, I, I'll say he's a, he's a naturally modest guy, and as you can tell, I am not. I think we are doing, I think we are, uh, doing a good job. Well, not, not to answer the question for you, but would not things like Site Selection Magazine over the last several years continuing to see North Carolina as a top choice for business be an indication that things are going pretty well? I mean, I'd like to think so, yes. Yeah, that, that it is working. Um, obviously, looking at the information that's been presented, um, product is one of the largest hindrances to recruitment and having product available. But having product available involves a certain amount of buy-in from the public to support having those resources. Can you speak to any strategies or specific policies that have been particularly successful into getting those further out stakeholders to buy into establishing product that may sit for four years but that has been helpful to get the community to support those efforts. I mean, I'll, I'll speak just from being in this uh, for, for 20 some years. I mean, I, I think a good way for a community to address that, if they've got some skeptics, which uh, all communities are, I mean, uh, the last thing any community wants to do is build something that may sit empty for years and years and years. That, that's not an ideal outcome for anyone. There is some degree of risk but you also have to look at the reward side of taking that risk. And I think whether it's bringing in folks uh, like ourselves who can tell a community just how often we see that need for an existing building, or better yet, bring in someone who does this for the corporations themselves. There are a lot of site selection consultants who would echo everything you've heard today about the value of having something like a spec building available for those prospects. Uh, the numbers don't lie. As I said, 75% of our experience has been those companies that come in and they need an existing building ready to go. I, Steve or John, I don't know if you, you guys are nodding your head, so I'm guessing it's about some, more than half, I would say. Yeah, and Steve, same for you. I mean, so if we're all seeing this, if Sheila's seeing that at the local level, that, that should tell you something about what the customer's preferences are. And I think you're trying to do this for the benefit of getting that customer. 
think if you look at that data or you bring in some of those customers themselves, I think that'd be a quick way to overcome any natural doubt people may have about whether or not this is the right strategy to take. I would add, you talk about strategies. You remember I mentioned those infrastructure building blocks. One of them is leadership. And that requires some people to have some courage, uh, you know, in year two to say, or year three to say, yes, hang with us. And so that, that's what it, that it's going to require that as well. So excellent question. Um, yeah, I didn't say it was easy, but that's what we have to do. And this is a place where if you're having a, a community discussion that, you know, is, it needs some help, you know, that's, this is the kind of thing that your statewide organization can help with by providing, you know, somebody to come down and talk about the actual experience or, or give you the, the, uh, the stats you need. So we, we, can, we can definitely be helpful there. I had another, another question. Jeremy. Yes, I understand that um, you know, tourism is definitely something we can all identify with, and you mentioned manufacturing. I understand that the EDPNC started to target the food and beverage sector. A little earlier now, I was curious if you could give us an update as to what those efforts have been starting to draw, if you've seen some successes there yet. Yeah, good. I mean, I, th I think at any given time, probably about 7 or 8% of the projects we're working on involve the food and beverage manufacturing sector, some aspect of that. Uh, so having someone who's a dedicated business recruiter focused on that sector just gives us someone who over time can build up that much more in relationships and expertise that'll hopefully help us win more of those deals. I don't have the numbers off the top of my head, but we've had a couple of uh, really nice food manufacturing recruitment wins and quite a number of food manufacturing expansion projects that have closed. So that's important, but also important is the fact that we can send this individual out there to industry conferences with our partners on her own, and she's out there selling North Carolina specifically for this industry. As Frank mentioned earlier, we want to make sure that certain food industry jobs are not at the same pay scale as others. We want to make sure that the jobs we're targeting tend to be ones that are at least at or above the kinds of community wages that we hope uh, that they'll be paying. Um, I also will put in a note to say that thanks to the work of folks like um, uh, General McKissick, uh, who I think many of you know in this room, we also have a dedicated position that's now focused on the military and defense industry. And we have had that now for the past 18 months. We know here in Eastern North Carolina how big that sector is for our economy. So having someone who can go get in front of defense-related companies to get them to consider locating North Carolina, that's also been a new industry expertise we've been happy to add in the past year and a half. You speak about military. We ought to own that. <laughs> I mean, in North Carolina, how are we, we, that, that, that just ought to be ours. And, and I mean, I'm looking at the people where this is the, the epicenter. I mean, I don't know what your list is, but we ought to be saying five years from now, if you talk about military, you start in North Carolina and then other places, my, my commercial. <laughs> Anyone else? Well, help me again in thanking Frank and Chris for their time. Thank you. I think it's easy to see on so many levels that uh, we're doing a lot of the right things uh, with economic development. If I could just add to, to the question about convincing the public, uh, I think that's part of what we're here for. Uh, as the investors, the board of directors, the members of Joe Ed, uh, we need to be those champions out there to make sure that we're pushing it um, and keep everybody informed that it is a marathon and it's a team effort. And we're all part of that team, whatever our role is. So I thank you uh, for your time today. I would be remiss if I didn't take time to thank Golden Corral for our meal today. Thank you very much. I see, I see Mr. Corral has already left the building, so be sure you thank Billy Sewell when you, when you get a chance to see him. Um, with that and with no further business to conduct today, I would declare our annual meeting adjourned, and thank you all once again for being here.